the somberness of that video probably more accurately represents the joy that most of us sometimes find ourselves in or the lack of joy or the fight for joy that we find ourselves in. That, that joy can be a, a somber and a hard time for us. That it's, it's something we, we fought for and we miss and it's an attitude that we struggle with to have in our lives. And so, in fact, we were in a, our D groups, our discipleship groups a few weeks ago. We were studying um, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, and we were looking at the fruit of the Spirit we're thinking about the fruit of the Spirit. And so if you know them, that's the, the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, and all the rest if I missed one. And we were just asking, what, which one of these, these aspects of the fruit of God's Spirit do we struggle with? And, and some said patience. A lot said patience. I said patience. But, but several said joy. Joy is something I struggle with. And so I, I can relate to that. I can, I, and that, that caught me as I sat there. I said, I kind of wrote, said, we should, we should think about that for a little bit. I, so I've told my story before in the earlier part of the church um, season, so maybe some of you aren't familiar, but about, about three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago, I went through about a year-long battle with, with pretty serious depression. I didn't know what it was until I was almost out of that fog, and I wasn't smart enough to go see some clinical help. But uh, I went through about a year battle of depression, just trying to figure out what was going on and just, it was just loss of joy and all those sorts of things. And uh, outwardly, I looked fine. I went through life. I did, did the stuff that life was required me to do. I preached on Sunday. I, was, I led worship on Sundays. I did the church stuff. But there was just this, this hole in, in, my, in my heart as far as joy and outlook. And I remember sitting in the, sitting in the backyard with my kids one, one week. It was beautiful. Uh, outside. And Hannah, I don't think she was born yet, but um, it was beautiful outside, and it was a perfect weather. It was not like the last week at all. It was, the sun was shining, the air was warm, the grass was freshly cut, and the kids were just, you know, they were behaving, they were being cute, and I had this flash smile of, in the, in the height of this depression, I had this flash moment where I, I smiled, I had this wave of joy, but it quickly disappeared. Like, it's like I smiled, and it went away. And so when I think about joy, there's a real struggle for us, for all of us. And I don't want to belittle anybody with fighting the struggling depression or anxiety issues or all sorts of things that lead to a loss of joy. But I think there is for everybody a longing for joy, like a longing for a lasting joy, a joy that will hold on to us in the, the low parts of our lives, a joy that is going to be with us during depression and sorrow and struggles and challenges and losses and all the kinds of hardships that we face. And so that's the kind of joy we need. The joy of that song that we heard is much more like the joy that we need, a joy that is, complace, that is, that is, uh, that is confident and content in Christ. And so that's what we're going to learn about over these next 11 to 12 weeks. We're going to be diving into the book of Philippians. And in the book of Philippians, Paul is in prison. Like, so he is, he's been arrested. He's gone on three giant missionary journeys. He's seen countless people come to Christ. He's seen churches started. He's been so successful in sharing the gospel. He's been able to just impact so many people's lives. But now he's arrested and he's in a Roman prison. And he's got some liberties, like he's able to do a few things in prison, but he's not able to do all the things in prison. He's he's still chained up. He's still in harsh living conditions. You're not exactly cared for when you're in a Roman's prison. You're, You're completely at the benevolence of other people. You're chained up. Your freedom is not your own. And so we have these letters, and Philippians is one of them, where Paul writes in the middle of this hardship, wondering, is tomorrow my execution day or is tomorrow my release day? And in this book of Philippians, there is a joy that is so much deeper than the joy that so many of us have experienced. It's a lasting joy. This, this is a book filled with joy from one of the hardest situations that a person could go through, wondering if you're going to die and chained up. And so I want to look at this, these uh, verses over the next uh, 11 weeks. It won't, won't always be as somber starting as that, but I think we have a lot to learn about joy joy in Christ that can survive prison cells, that can survive struggles, that can be with us our entire lives. And so let's look at this uh, chapter together. We're going to start in the first 11 verses. So if you've got a Bible or you have pulled up an app on your phone, here is the first 11 verses, and then we're going we're to break it apart more specifically. Here's, what, here's how it begins. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, including 
the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion uh, until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I deeply miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Do you hear the joy in those opening verses? A man writing from a prison cell begins to express his joy, and we're going to dig in that for these next few weeks as we walk through Philippians. Let me pray, and then we'll get into this text for today more specifically. God, thank you again for this morning. Thank you for those songs that that look to your grace, that that help us reflect on your grace, the, the easiness in our hearts it is to pull away from it, but yet the amazement that we should have for it. God, thank you for the the truth of that song that we can look up because there's no one above you. We can look back and see how you've been faithful, but we can bow our hearts and we can serve you. And so help us to to be all about you in our lives, that you get the glory, you get the honor. And Lord, one of the ways we can be all about you in our lives is simply by living out a joy, a contentment, that is deeper than our circumstances, that is deeper than our, our loss and our pain and our hardships, not to, not to belittle them at all, but to elevate your glory and your message and your truth. And so help us to be about a joy bigger than us. Help us to live that, help others to see that, and help that to be a shining witness to the world around us. Thank you, God, so much for this joy. Help us to have it. Help us to begin to shape our hearts after it as we study this book together. Lord, with your word, convict us through your spirit. Show us where we fall short, where we need to change, where we need to grow, and where we need to change. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we begin this new series on joy, we're going to look specifically today at the joy of partnership, that the joy we have in partnership. And, and you know how this goes. I grew up in the, I was born in 1982, if you don't, don't do the math, I'm 30, turning 36 this year. But when I was in middle school, the show called Power Rangers came out. And um, I was just a little bit too old to admit that it was fun, and that you know, it was cool to see things explode and karate kicks being done, but I was still young enough to think it was cool. And so I had this tension watching Power Rangers, so I just watched it with my little brothers and thought it was fun. Now Jackson is obsessed with Power Rangers, so I get to watch it all over again. But, but Power Rangers have the exact same plot line the entire show. Like every single show has the same plot line. The, uh, the, the monster comes, they initially fight them in their little like suits or whatever. It's morphin time, they transform. And then they fight them. The monster loses, so then they, they sprinkle miracle Grow or something on this guy. So he gets to be the size of a skyscraper. And then all of a sudden, they have to get their, their zords out, these, these robot transformer things, and they fight, they fight this other guy. And so what inevitably happens, and Voltron, by the way, was this exact same way of, you know, when going back another generation, they would, they would inevitably fight this giant monster on their own, trying to do it kind of separated in, in the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the Pterodactyl and, all these, and the, 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 all these sorts of different zords. They'd try to fight the bad guy by themselves. And inevitably, they would start to get you know, beat up. They would lose. And so what would happen is they would merge into this megazord, and that's when all the good stuff happened. When they, they finally got together, and one became a leg, and the other became another leg. One became the arms, and the chest, and the head, and the sword. And they, they merged themselves together, and that's when the power was there. That's when the bad guy had no chance, and they beat him up. And so now as an adult watching the show with Jackson, I kind of go... Why didn't they just start with that? Like, why do they have to like, go through all the pain of losing and getting beat up only to bring out the big guns at the end? 
But here is the point and the principle. When you go it alone, you often lose. But when you're in partnership together, there's strength. And that's a pretty good message to walk away from. In fact, that's a Christian message that, that when you are in following Jesus, when you are living for Jesus, when you try to go it alone, there's, there's struggles, there's challenges, you're going to get beat up, you're going to feel isolated. But when you're together, there's strength. When you're with other people, there's, there's power there. And so when you're in partnership, there's joy. When you're in partnership, there's joy. And that's what Paul expresses in these first few verses. He, he shares with us the powerful joy that comes through togetherness, through gospel partnership, through people who, who love Christ like he loves, loves Christ, to people who serve Christ like he serves Christ. So even in that prison cell, he realizes that it's not just him by himself, but he's got partners who follow and love and serve Jesus all around the world and in this Philippian church. And so he's like that Power Ranger, merged together for strength, clinging to the strength. Now you may think to yourself when you hear the word partnership, I don't find partnership all that joyful. I've done group partners in, in school, like when, when you're in high school or when you're in college or at work and you get assigned a project with partner. It's not a joyful moment. And so what does it take for Christian partnership to be like Paul, to have this kind of joy-filled embrace moment where it's, it's good for us, it's, it's healthy for us to be in partnership? What does that look like? That's the question we're going to ask ourselves today. In fact, the big question there in your bulletin is, is how can we find joy in partnerships? How can we find joy in these Christian partnerships? Here's the first thought. We'll walk through these relatively quickly. If we are going to have the kind of partnerships that give us joy, we must unify in God's mission. We must be united, be partnered together on the mission of Christ. This is the first place we see joy for Paul here, is that he is, he is united together with these Philippians, with this church he's writing to. And even in prison, he's thankful, he's joyful about this partnership. Here's the verses that we read, and they're also, they also are available on the screen. Here's what Paul says. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to stop there just for a second because I love the way Paul opens up his letters. Uh, this, these are the first few verses. It's, it's basically a salutation. It's used often, but, but with Christ, there's so much more meaning. When, when you say grace and peace, he's talking about God's grace to you and God's peace to you. And specifically in that order, we'll know peace when we know God's grace. And so grace to you and peace uh, through God. And what I love about the heart of Paul here is there is every reason for Paul to complain. Like, you know, when you go through her, maybe you know people like this, maybe you're one of those people that when, when something's hurting, when something's wrong, like you want others to hurt with you, so you, you ramp it up, you moan about it, you, you post it on Facebook, so that way you get the sympathy likes and the sympathy calls and the sympathy conversations, and everyone knows that you're hurting. And I'm not saying we shouldn't share our burdens with others, because that's clearly a biblical principle. But here Paul says grace and peace to you. Like the guy stuck in a prison cell who's, who's hurting and underfed and probably cold and chained up and has so limited freedom and is waiting for death is wishing grace on this free and thriving Philippian church. He's wishing grace and peace to somebody else. That even in his pain, he's able to extend that to others. It's just a simple sign of his joy here that he's able to push it beyond himself. And yes, we need to share our burdens. And yes, we need to be open. And it's okay to post about our pain. But it's also okay to wish well for others, to, to help see others and want others to know the grace and peace of the Lord. Now, verse 3 how, is how it continues. He says this, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always with joy for all of you in every prayer, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul says, I give thanks to you because of the partnership we have in the gospel from the very first day you came to faith 
until now. The togetherness they have. And what Paul is talking about is the fact that these people have the same mission. He in prison and them in Philippi, they have the same mission. It's Jesus Christ. It's his gospel. It's the great commandment to take the message of Jesus to all nations, teaching them to obey and live everything Jesus taught. That's the message that he's sharing. That's the partnership they have. And even though Paul is chained up, and even though these Philippians are free, they are united in partnership on that mission. You're going to see later in this book how Paul is actually using his imprisonment to further the gospel so that those in the prison are hearing and coming to Christ. And so this moment is a unifying moment because even though they're free and even though he's, he's not free as a prisoner, they are united under the command and the mission of Jesus Christ. And so their circumstances are different, but they are together in what Jesus wants to do. They are partners in what Jesus wants to do. Really early on in um, Pam and our parenting journey, when, when Kalen was two and a half, Jackson was born. And so for two and a half years, Kalen was princess of the house. Like everything, everything was hers. She had double attention and she quite honestly needed it. And so we needed it, but everything was hers. And then one day, mommy's belly started to get a little bit different. And then here comes baby brother Jackson, big eight and a half pound bowling ball boy comes home. And now the family's divided. And I remember, this is back when we lived in Virginia. I remember the, I remember the first time Pam left me alone with uh, Jackson and Kaylin. It wasn't long after this was born, but it was probably a just, I need a minute to go do something. to. My, so I, I left, I was there with Kaylin and Jackson. And Kaylin was kind of mad with me because I was play dad. I was like, I, let's go in the sunroom, let's play, let's Legos, let's do these things. And uh, she was kind of mad that now Jackson was super fussy and I couldn't do what she wanted to do. And so there was this tension that I was trying to care for a cranky Jackson and I was trying to, and Kaylin wanted to, her daddy to play with her. And so they had this, there kind of was this anger going on between Kaylin and Jackson and myself. There's just this tension. And so in, in the desperation, I remember saying, Kaylin, Jackson is really fussy. Can you help me to take care of him? Like, I need your help. Can you go find a pacifier? Can you go find his buddy? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you help rock this little rocker thing? And so what I did was I pulled Kaylin in on the mission, and then all of a sudden the room changed, because no longer is it Jackson and Kaylin in competition, but rather together, she and I were working toward caring for him. We had a united mission. We had a united mission. And so as Christians, this is such a critical point to remember. It's really easy to be attention with one another. It's really easy for churches to turn inward and look for all their needs to be met, and all their wants to be met, and all their things to be met, and comes wants and needs and preferences and desires and all these personalities. But if we can keep the mission the main thing, if we can keep the fact that we've been called to share Christ and go be Christ and to love our community, love our neighbors and fulfill the Great Commission, if we can keep that front and center, it brings us joy. Because it's not about us. It's not about our way. It's not about our life. It's not about what we want or what we've always done or what we think we should do. It's about the mission. The mission is what matters. So much to that Paul will later say, look, I don't care what they say about me. As long as Christ is proclaimed, I'm happy. As long as the gospel advances, I am happy. So let's keep the mission, the mission. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing. Paul says, I thank God every day because of our partnership in the gospel, that we're together in this. We're a team. We're locked arms in the gospel. Here's the second thing we see. Not only do we unite and unify on mission, but we also unify in hope. We share a hope. One of the ways that we can find joy in partnership with other believers is when we cling to and spur on the, the hope that we have together. Look at verse 6. Here's what Paul says, and it's one of the most powerful hope-saturated verses in the Bible. It says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's such short. Let me read it again. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
that hope-saturated verse shows us that, that God is still doing a work in us, that God is still doing something in us, that even though we feel like we're low sometimes and we don't know where our life is going and we seem like we're far from God or we're struggling in the moment with our spirituality, we have questions about this, doubts about this, that verse reminds us that God who has started something good will see it completed until that day when Christ returns, when Christ is on the throne, until the day of the Lord. And this is such an important reminder because I am not all that good at finishing things. That may come as a big surprise to you. That may come as a shocker. But like, I've got a lot of projects at home that I'll probably never finish. That someone else will finish, whoever owns a home after me, or, or the Lord will come back and they'll just never get done. But the reality is there are a lot of things that I just don't finish. In fact, we had a ceiling fan in our house that stopped working in our family room. For like three years, it stopped working. And I kept on telling myself, oh, next week, next week, next week, I'll climb up into the attic. I'll, I'll try to figure out why the wires aren't working. I'll, I'll try to figure out why the remote's not working. Some other day, I'll climb in the attic. I'll get it done. And so one summer would go by, no ceiling fan. It'd become winter, ah, oh, I got some time to think about it. No big deal. It's winter. Who needs a fan in the winter? Then the next summer would come, and guess what? I wouldn't fix the fan. Wouldn't fix the fan. Eventually, actually, three years later, I fixed the fan. And it wasn't even that hard of a fix. It was a 20-minute fix. And I've got a hundred other projects just like that that are completely undone and may never get done. You probably have the same thing at your house, let's be honest. But here's the good news. God does not view us as unfinished projects. God is working us and, and the, the, the work that God is doing in our hearts, he is going to continue to do. He's going to continue to work in us and he's not abandoned us he is working and that should be a joyful moment paul because of his partnership with them reminds them of that paul reminds this church that god is god is working in you the hope is that that you're not there yet but god is going to work god is going to preserve you god is going to to work in you he's going to he's going to help you he's going to preserve you through this in fact this is a, this is a theme we see all throughout the bible one of the verses is john Chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. Jesus says this, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me. He is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Or how about this verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. God is going to do something in you. And Paul reminds them of this. He reminds the Philippians that God is working in all of us. Now, now, here's why this brings joy. To be told that you're a work in progress is not all that exciting. To be told that you're under construction is not usually that fun. Like, I don't like driving through construction zones. I like driving through finished products. But, but here's why spiritually this matters. If God is still working in your life, if God is still doing something in your life, you can view life differently. In the, in the failure moments of your life, you can hope that God's not finished with you. You can hope that he's still working in you. You can embrace the, the messiness of God's renovating work in your heart because he's working you toward that completion. You can live with the messiness in your life, but also you can live with the messiness in other people's lives. This is where partnership comes to play. If you believe that God is doing a, a work in us and he's moving toward Christ-likeness, then you can love people not because of who they are now, but because of who Christ is making them to be in Jesus, who God is helping them to become in Christ. Does that make sense? Like when somebody's angry and has this angry outburst and throws things and, and hurts you or backstabs you or is not getting something, you don't have to go, they'll, that's who they are, that's who they'll always be and, and blow them off. You can say, God is still working on them like God is still working on me. And so the more joy, the more hope you can have in God's work in other people's lives and our lives, the more joy you'll have because you'll enjoy the journey. 
the journey that God is doing something in us, that God is working something in us. And yes, we're not done. And yes, we want to strive toward that. But we can embrace the messiness and the hope that God is not done with us. So we can unify around that hope. Here's our third thought. We want to also unify around this common grace. What brings us together in joyful partnership is is mission, is hope. It's also grace. Look at verse 7. Indeed, it is right for you, or for me to think of this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affections of Christ Jesus. You know, he's super clear here that this church, that Paul and these Philippians, they share a grace. They're, they're partners in grace. And because of that grace, they, they lo- he loves them. He cares for them. He's, he's got a bond with them that's deeper than, than this imprisonment, that's deeper than the miles that separate them, that's deeper than their differences. And this is so critical because you and I are going to build our friendships on a couple different things. Sometimes we're going to build our friendships on proximity, like, hey, you're here, I'm here, let's be friends. It's kind of like high school friends. You're friends because you sit in the same class and you're in the same school and you ride the same bus, and so you become friends. And that's okay, but, but oftentimes those friends begin to fade because of, they're just built on proximity. When you stop seeing them, you stop being friends with them. Sometimes we build friendships on common interests. These seem to last a little bit longer. Like if you like computer games and they like computer games, maybe you still play computer games. If you like um, this TV show and they like TV show, maybe you have watching parties. Maybe you talk about it on Facebook with each other. If you like music and they like music, sometimes you might get together and jam. And so interest can pull you together. Sometimes maybe you just like, like being around each other. You get mutual benefits. Like you like, you like their personality. They, they make you laugh sometimes. They're fun to be around. Those friendships can last. But when, when unity is built deeper than that, and I'm talking about the unity we have in Christ, that we have been created anew in Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who rose again on the third day and gives us new life. When your friendships are rooted in that, in the partnerships and graces, you can have a love and affection that Paul talks about here that's deeper than just those passing affinities. It's bigger than that. It's greater than that. When we're linked together by Christ, there'll be a joy there that even though we're different, even though we think differently and talk differently sometimes and like different things, Christ links us together in his grace and we can find joy in that. And for Paul, this joy wasn't broken in prison, but yet this grace brought them together. And he's, he's thankful to see it play out in their lives. And so I would encourage you, there are lots of reasons to make friends. There are lots of reasons to go to a church You may like that, you might like this, you may like this element, you may like this personality or that structure, but let's make sure that what unites us is Christ, that what unites us and what drives the affection for us is like what Paul says, it's the partnership we have in grace. Here's the last thought. We also unify in growth. And so just to kind of walk back through, we have the same mission we're partners on the mission that God gives us. And when we're partners, we find joy. We're, we're, we unify in hope because we both have a hope that God is working us someplace. And sometimes I fail and sometimes you fail and sometimes you're working on stuff and sometimes I'm working on stuff. But as a partners, we can go forward with God's plan for our life. We can unify in the grace like Jesus Christ that though we were sinners, Christ died for us and brought us into his families as adopted sons of God. And lastly, we unify as we can hope and see each other grow. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 says this, I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of of God. Paul prays here simply, I pray that you keep growing in Jesus. I pray that you grow in knowledge of Christ, knowledge of God. I pray that you grow in discernment, the ability to see what's right and wrong and do it. I pray that you grow in the fruit of righteousness, which is just simply what Christ wants in our lives. Paul prays for this church that they would just continue to grow. 
And that's what's so good about partnerships. You need people praying for you like this in your life. Yeah, you can grow spiritually on your own, but what really refines you is others together pointing out blind spots and praying for sanctification, praying for growth, that we grow together. And there's so much joy in that. There is so much joy. We were talking about just our, our, light, our discipleship groups, our D groups, and how we're seeing God grow us. And that's, that's joyful. And I pray that somebody is praying this for you, that you will be growing in your love and your knowledge and your discernment and your fruits of righteousness, that that's why the church exists, to help us grow, to be with us as we grow. It unifies us. When we're just about ourselves, when we're just about coming for an experience or coming for our fun, we don't grow. But when we're trying to help each other grow, it changes everything. You find joy in that. I hope that you see joy in your Christian life as you grow. There's nothing worse than like not seeing progress sometimes. And sometimes there are seasons like that. I was trying to lose some weight and still trying to lose some weight uh, earlier this year. And for about a month, I got stuck at a specific, uh, like a, about, about, a, about a, point, a point on the scale. I got stuck. And it was so frustrating. Like I'm, I'm eating nothing but avocado and kale smoothies and I'm running every single day. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I just can't get below this, this marker. And so it was so frustrating for a month just to be dieting and exercising and not break through that like little barrier. And sometimes we can feel that way with our growth that we're, we're frustrated not seeing growth. What happens when we get a community is we can together lift one another up together pray for that in one another's life and and come around one another to help them continue to grow and so we unify in mission we unify on hope we unify in god's grace and we unify in growth and if those four points are what unifies us together i promise your partnership your community with other believers will bring you the kind of joy we see in here in, in paul that it's not about his circumstances it's not about his loss or his gain it's about the partnerships he has with other people. My encouragement to you is, is don't live like a Power Ranger on your own. Like, go for the Megazord. Go all in. Don't, don't, don't be beat up out by yourself. Don't be the lone ranger struggling for joy, struggling for, for community. Drive into community. Share a mission. Share a hope. Share grace. Share growth. And be a part of that. I hope that is you. I hope you can see something where you can grow. If you're a believer, maybe, this, maybe you need to step up and be involved in a discipleship group where you can grow together to have more relationships. Maybe you need to find a way to use your gifts and to serve and to be a part of the church more at a deeper level. If you don't know Christ yet, I would encourage you, there's so much joy in this community, but it starts with Jesus Christ. It starts with that hope and that grace that comes through Jesus Christ who died for us. I would encourage you to make a decision today to know Jesus Christ who lived that perfect and sinless life, who died on the cross for your sins, and who says if you repent and believe, you can have new life. He was buried, but on that third day, he rose again, fulfilling that promise and that hope that we can have new life in him. The Bible tells us if you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to believe in Jesus Christ, turn from your sins, and uh, trust him and follow after him. And in a simple decision or a prayer like that, your life can dramatically change to a mission, to God's hope, to God's grace, and people who want to help you grow. I hope that's a decision you've made today. Let's, let's pray together as we have a time to respond.